course programs like you have here, and apprenticeships and internships and every opportunity to have hands-on experience, especially in working studios where uh, a person has uh, access to uh, an entire range of uh, working possibilities where uh, everything from being able to make a living, uh, which I think is part of the hand skills one learns is uh, a level of efficiency, uh, also to be able to uh, pull together whatever idea uh, one has in as uh, clear a manner as possible and figure out how best to uh, bring materials forward and skills that are available at, at that moment uh, to be able to realize those ideas with elements. As we were talking, at first I didn't think I, I knew it, I had an answer, but I think in addition to those things, having much earlier exposure to working with materials, having uh, young children experience things that are tactile. Uh, I've heard people tell me that when students get to art school now, they've had very little experience with actual tools, like screwdrivers, things like that. And that, uh, that that was something that was pretty common, not in my own background, because I can't make anything, but just in terms of people understanding what it's like to be in the workshop, to be around all those materials, to start that much earlier. Okay, I finally have something to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is okay, because being a critic, I'm not creating anything. I'm looking at something else and second guessing it. It comes after, and I have to process. So, I'm the worst person to ask uh, the first question, too. Um, but what I would say is a little bit different from all this material. I would say what might be crucial to the future of craft is how a sense of identity will be maintained. And I'm thinking of that mostly because of the comments that I've heard these last couple of days from just in individual conversations about uh, what's happening to craft programs in schools that are being rolled into you know, like ceramics that rolled into sculpture or something like that. Does it still feel like ceramics then, even if it's still being taught, if it's being given this different name, then do we have the same sense of the, of the identity of this field, the character that, of belonging um, to a tradition? Can you keep that if, if, we don't, if the name isn't there anymore? Speak, speaking as the historian and watching from the sideline as well, I think these things wax and wane. You know, we can look at um, the arts and crafts movement from the 19th century, and then the studio craft, you know, half a century later, and like these things do have their undulation. And you know, I think I spoke to and this is what my answer was from my talk earlier today. But I can also add that you know now there are PhDs in craft craft history, and these these when we get these things out and we. We categorize them, and we're meeting with people who've actually studied this as an academic subject, with a framework, with theory, without theory, and it, it, it's all going to come. It's very exciting time to be in this field, at least from my perspective. A lot of work to do, but very exciting. The best is yet to come. That's the way I see it. From not a making, but watching you all, having had made, and will continue to make. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, I was just. I had this incredible experience of going down to be one of the adjunct faculty on this new non-residential um, master's course in craft studies that's being offered through Warren Wilson College in, uh, in North Carolina. And so it's a, an entire you know, master's course built around the field, and such a thing would have been unthinkable, at least to me, 20 years ago. So I do think there's a lot happening in that way. Um, I just wanted to sort of totally agree with what Janet is saying, though which is this question about loss of identity. And you know, probably you would agree with this, Janet, when we both started working, there was this art craft thing that people were worried about. And I feel like the big question now is not, does art justify craft status? Sorry, does craft justify art status? But um, rather, do we need to hold a center? Or can craft really be this infinitely observable thing that doesn't really need a constituency or a lobby behind it anymore, like the Craft Council was um, in its glory days. And, you know, I recognize that my own work has usually tried to promote this idea of breadth and seeing craft in all sorts of different contexts, um, probably because it just seems to me um, kind of ethically right to see it that way. 
But if you if you lose the sense of infrastructure and investment in the process, and you think, well, everything's craft, so everyone's going to learn somehow, and all we need to do is give the students an iPhone and a you know desktop computer when they show up, or not even that, and they'll be fine. What you of course lose is the very um, potency that makes multidisciplinarity potentially interesting, right? Because if nobody can do anything, then what's the point of being multidisciplinary? You're just going from one empty shop to the next. So I think the really key thing is that the institutions like Cleveland Institute still have a sense and a respect for the um, craft-based disciplines so that interdisciplinarity can have some, some worthwhile energy behind it. Thank you all. Um, I have a question about uh, how you see your role and maybe our roles broadly addressing diversity within the field as um, practitioners, as educators, maybe trying to recruit um, young people into the field as um, critics and um, curators. Um, you know what happens when uh, the collections that are being donated are you know, so sort of from a canon that maybe was not so diverse, or even thinking about, you know, Eurocentric hierarchies of knowledge and how upending that might, might sort of help things. I guess speaking to collection, I mean, I try my very best, I'm on actually a committee of diversity at the museum about collection building and about, and not just strictly collection, also about, you know, who works there. Um, we've just been added on to this initiative that's uh, uh, national with several uh, heavy hitting museums um, to start to do internships or fellowships actually on the undergraduate level strictly for, of diversity um, to, to indoctrinate this idea that museums are a place you can work would want to work. Um, it's like summer institute and then um, you meet with a curator once a month in shadow and be part of it. You know, you're in undergraduate school, so you can't be there every day. So this is hoping to bring up people from a, at a very early age in their art his, history studies. Um, in terms of building collection, you know, I would like to see more artists of color e existing in, in these in this field. It, it has to come from a, another angle. I, I can't help that aspect except to be encouraging. But also to actually you know, acquire and go after work, and then of course displaying in in the museum and talking about it in, in the proper and appropriate ways. Um, and I'm very much for that and working towards that. Um, it's an issue that uh, I know when I was uh, on the board of the Craft Council, we were dealing with, and also this consortium of craft schools that I've been working with, of how to become more inclusive. Is uh, takes a lot of hard work, and it's uh, it's not just making it that uh, come in. It's like that we have to go out, and you have to be open to uh, um, making mistakes. Uh, you know, I think that the point, if you you want to become more inclusive, you're going to say something that's wrong. You're going to make a mistake. You're not going to quite get it, and to have a dialogue where people can begin to say. Can articulate what's wrong in the conversation. So, for example, at the at the craft schools, which are making a concerted effort to bring in a more diverse constituency, I had a conversation with somebody who said, uh, um, "Did it ever occur to you?" I was saying, well, "You know, we have lots of scholarship support," and and this uh, woman from the foundation said, "Well, did it ever occur to you that actually the uh, people of color actually don't want to come to what you're offering?" You know, it's not like, well, we have everything, just come in. It's like, well, we don't actually want to come into what you have. And so I think that's when it really struck me that the, the amount of work and uh, the openness to conversations is really critical. Um, I'll, I'll just say something um, slightly in another direction, although I completely agree with what you were saying about embracing the difficulty of those processes. And it's just to underline the maybe obvious point that craft is already a hell of a lot more diverse than most other cognate areas in the visual arts. And that's more evident in respect to gender. So if you think about 20th century, you know, as you were saying, Elizabeth, 20th century craft history is already 
pretty diverse compared to painting and sculpture or architecture, certainly. Um, particularly in terms of women's contributions, and that has been recognized a lot in the past, is even more so now, hopefully, will be still more in the future. Um, but I think another reason to think of craft in this very open way, and not just as a studio craft movement, is that it allows you to think across lines of gender, and class, and ethnicity, and geography, and sexual orientation, in a way that um, probably, again, fine art narratives will always struggle with but it's all there in craft history if you know where to look and you have the instinct to look. So that's a really great asset um, of our field and one that I think helps us, will help us make a big contribution. Can I say something? Um, I, uh, yes and yes. And as, when, when I teach, all right, I'm gonna back up. When I gave my talk the other day, that was sort of the point I was trying to make about craft. When I teach, I think like most of the, if you're trying to help someone get better uh, as an artist, there's, you have to have some sort of template as to what excellence is. And everything I know is handed down from a white European model. So I <laughs> had a complete collapse in the ability to create work because of that, which is probably great. Uh, <clears throat> because I don't think it ever was based on anything really, except that, which is just one thing. And that's why I was trying to say that the crafts are more um, embracing of other forms, because there is, art has to define itself really narrowly for economic reasons, but I guess probably for psychological reasons as well that I wouldn't even want to get into. Uh, you know, or, um, but I think that's why craft is, if, if it has a definition, it's everything else. And that's its strength. I think I just, I'll add to what I said earlier, though, it's something I'd be remiss to, not, to say. You know, museums are ever aware of the shifting demographics in this country, especially in urban centers. Um, you know, we're, at the PMA, we're under construction right now, we're gonna be redoing our American art galleries, and we're, I mean, I sit in these meetings, and the collections are not craft-based because well, they are craft-based historically. I mean, they're 1700 to 1830, and there's a lot of craft in there, but the conversation can't be from a white narrative. And we're con at least I'm constantly pushing to, to have that conversation. It's uncomfortable. You know, I am a white woman trying to shape a conversation that is not maybe something that should be coming from my mouth, but I am hyper-aware of what the issues should be, and are trying to be um, and we as a museum are trying to have that conversation and, and uh, weave it into how we present the collections. Any museum that's not having this conversation is, is going to struggle. Um, you cannot be opening anything new without bringing that up. I mean, just in the New York Times a few weeks ago, was a show on Dutch um, paintings, uh, nautical and ship paintings, and there was a conversation that these were all slave ships. How could they not call that out of the label? You have to be uberly aware of what we're talking about, not just the regular conversation that our history has privileged. I was at a, a round table at the Metropolitan recently, and it was specifically the Metropolitan's American wing, and one of the contributors who was African American said, um, that asked them in a tone of sort of innocence, had, had they ever considered just retitling it, uh, because they were having a discussion about how to make it more diverse. And he said, well, why don't you just retitle it, the, um, the wing of uh, American white supremacy. You won't have to change anything. Right. Good point. And, and how does that connect to? Yeah. But how does that connect to your question? Is you know, if your audience is is has shifted demographically and they see either no commentary or conversation about even how whatever terrible it was to have to identify and call it out or show work that is of, of diverse people, then how does anyone then ever be inspired to then want to go out and make? And that's, so I can't fix the problem by getting, bringing people to art school, but I can fix it as a curator to open up that conversation, however uncomfortable it might be, or show work that is on the edge that is not the typical narrative. That is my responsibility. Another question? Uh, possibly paralleling um, Lars' question. What is craft's responsibility in terms of social impact and addressing disenfranchised communities? That's a hand skill, just this. <laughs> um, 
Well, you know, I, I just think of uh, studio craft as being, it's such a veneer, um, you know, when you think about humans as makers, people in communities who have traditions who make things. Um, and I think uh, acknowledging those communities, being open to those things, I think uh, uh, allows people to talk to one another. The, the crossover that you have because uh, I know how to make things and another person knows how to make things and all of a sudden you're, you're not, uh, uh, it doesn't break down by race or ethnicity, it's like, that's really great, how did you figure that out? And I think if we get to that, to me that's where, where craft is, is most exciting and uh, I think maybe Judith and I were talking earlier, many years ago there used to be a World Craft Council and I guess it's kind of more dormant now, but, but it was looking across a whole world in terms of people as makers and I realize some of that can maybe be uh, cliche, but I think it just gives you the sense that there's much more in common that we can see we have in common from from the left and the right in America even, if people could uh, get past the, the, that veneer and get into uh, understanding one another as, as uh, human makers. I think it's got tremendous potential for actually joining us together. I have a question rather than an answer to that, I think. And it's just that I, my observation over some years of looking at this field uh, is that when I see uh, political activism and something that come, that's generated by craft, say the, the kind of work that's called uh, craftivism nowadays, or um, well, what would be another example? I don't know. Um, anyway, oh, I guess uh, there was a there was a show of ceramics called the Judy Schwartz uh, organized that was called uh, something about political craft, but that's not that's not her word. She had a cleverer title, but anyway. It's always felt to me a little bit like a strain, like it was, um, uh, particularly in the case of that show, it was an effort to make craft fit into the expectation of art, um, commenting on things. And, you know, I don't know, I, I guess I'm asking this, I could be completely wrong about it, but it did, because there's no reason that people in this field should not be just as concerned about a political or a social issue as anybody else is. But I've always kind of felt that craft was a bit more um, of, of a field for introverts and that it was less naturally um, taking that kind of a role. What do you think? I, I don't know about the introversion part. I've just seen my Roberto Lugo again. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I'm not an introvert. But um, my re reaction to your question, Doug, was to think that craft is already precisely the thing that disenfranchised people do. And in fact, this is something I talk about in my book, Invention of Craft. Craft was invented as a means of describing the creativity of disenfranchised people as a way of subjugating a lower than art and industry. That is where the idea comes from. So it is literally the material creative expression of the disenfranchised. That's like a great definition of craft in its modern um, incarnation. So. This is, this is like the good news, that it really is as simple as simply promoting the values of um, respect and recognition for across people wherever they happen to be working and however they happen to be working. I think the crucial and difficult thing, and this is kind of lines up with what you're saying, Janet, is that this, this is like a big like deep breath moment for us as a field, because what we have to do really to embrace that possibility is to abandon the studio craft model and also abandon the idea that craft should lean in an art direction and that's what's going to make it yeah, to have sure respect. Yeah, because you have to start thinking about like, labor unions and you know what used to be called folk practices, vernacular practices, like that basket maker I showed. And that that's a big, big leap for I think a lot of people to take, particularly in museums and collectors and that kind of thing, but it's happened. Or even like the Sloyd model, the idea yeah. of, of bringing craft and education um, back uh, because uh, that that was intentional in, in many major cities and connecting to in some cases museum institutions a lot of the great I mean our museum it had a school of art and it was open to anyone I and mean, the, the Flint Museum um, example I gave in my talk um, the reason why they had an art school is not so that you know 
Little Mary Jane could take a class on Saturday. It was actually for the Ford um, automobile employees to, to use at night so that they wouldn't go crazy doing the one widget they did every day. It was a way of engaging their creativities with their hands and feel good about making something creative and, and that was an expression of themselves. Um, or, you know, if it's in Boston, you know, using Sloyd as a way to uplift the communities that were downtrodden and, and poor and giving them a skill that then they could become, whether an artist or through industry, using their hands to, to be able to not just survive, but go beyond that. Um, we've lost that, that thing. Um, you know, Philadelphia could definitely use that thing. Hey, Tom, can you talk a little bit about the, I'm sorry, I missed your talk, so you might have already explain this in some depth, but when I think about disenfranchised craftspeople and, you know, skilled laborers workforce, you've obviously worked with these people who are in a very kind of fragile and endangered industry. So how did they think about the question of empowerment with relation to their skills when you talk to them about it? You're talking about inside uh, the industrial facility? Yeah. Work? Well, no, they're, they're totally empowered, you know, in their, in their situation as an employee-owned uh, company. They have a vested interest in taking on the most challenging work that their skills, uh, you know, could uh, could realize. So, no, it's not inside that world. But there's different models. Um, you know, this one. I mean, I don't know how. Uh, there are other industrial setups that I've been in that that were pretty devastating to the morale of uh, the people who were working there. But in the forging facility where I produce the larger scale works, it's a very different model, and that's why I choose to be there as much as I do. But some are kind of set up on a 19th century model where, um, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the day that we were at the Kohler uh, factory. It was, I've been there three times now. And the second time I was there, uh, we watched a, um, uh, a, a massive uh, piece of equipment being moved in almost as if it was paraded uh, down the center aisle where uh, the foundry workers you know, were kind of in between shifts, uh, but they were all just before break, so they were, everybody was stand, uh, you know, stood up alongside the equipment that they were operating, and this massive uh, piece of equipment was coming down through the aisles almost like a parade, and, and I watched the blood drain from almost everyone's faces as they realized what it was as a robotic uh, you know, device that was going to, you know, that 20 jobs are gone by the time that, that piece of equipment has been set up and has been operational. And that had been going on for some time, you know, too, in the factory. So the hand skills that had been passed on uh, for generations through this factory, first started in the 19th century, uh, were disappearing at a rapid rate just based on the new technologies introduced. Um, yeah. I did want to say, you know, something too. I mean, we, as studio practitioners, there's only so much we can do. But I've I've always opened the studio up to uh, ages 13 to 17 kids that that don't have an opportunity in uh, in a classroom situation where so many of the high schools have have uh, you know uh, dissected and sold off you know any of the shop programs that might have been there when some of us were going to school. And uh, so this, the shop has always been open for those kinds of free classes. And you know, to your point, Stu, having a young person early enough be able to take on uh, a responsibility for what their hands are capable of doing, uh, given the opportunity, is a really remarkable transformation that one can see happen really quickly. And it doesn't take very much. That's the thing that's so beautiful about uh, opening our studios up in that way is that uh, that we often can create a kind of impact uh, without uh, feeling as though we're having to take somebody under our wing. They, they're perfectly capable, most of the young uh, women and, or young girls and boys that have come to work with me, um, you know, they pick it up. They don't want to be nurtured. They just want to be given the opportunity and uh, to look over somebody's shoulder they respect. Um, I think that when, you know, when you do a, a when a class comes through and they see these objects integrated, there's a lot of power that these things, it's not just the traditional, you know, most people, most kids know what clay is. They're, 
they use it in school. You know, they understand, maybe they're not handing glass, but they're also doing things with wire. And so these materials, they, they have a tactile understanding. Now, do they have a deep, um, I love these words of uh, material intelligence or um, material intuition? Maybe intuition, because, you know, we've all remember those days. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure in any of your parents' closet or in a drawer, there's a piece, there's a little pinch pot you made them. I, mean, I found my pinch pot that I made in my father's drawer when I cleaned out the house, and I was like amazing that he saved this. I think it was from second grade. I was shocked. I mean, think that that was important. Um, kids make these things. They know. Remember that I remember making that pot. And so when you walk in, you're saying there's some power to seeing these things together. So I would only think that the divorce of those things later on sends another message. It removes that we forget. It's like a. It's like when you're a child, you see the fairies, and then all of a sudden you grow up and you don't see them anymore. And so I, I would suggest that. Um, by this reincorporation of these materials in the real galleries allows for us to bring back that intuition that existed in our earlier days. But don't you think it's, um, so this question about putting a craft object in a, um, in a painting and sculpture gallery or something that was previously only to be used for that, that's great as long as the craft galleries don't go away? Correct. Is well, I agree. I'm not saying that it replaces the craft gallery. Yeah. I don't want at least for my wish, for my museum, in terms of the collection I'm responsible for, there is some power in having a, you know, 2,000, 3,000 square foot space dedicated just to this material. But I don't want it um, isolated. I don't want it on an island that I'm not allowed, once I'm given that space, oh, you have your space and you can't breach the other space. That's not up for conversation, as far as I'm concerned. It's, I'm expecting to be integrated as much as I am expected in some instances to be isolated. They're, they're not separated, they're connected. And how that affects the craft field, I think that sends a, an important message when a living craftsman comes and they see their work side by side um, in the contemporary art gallery with other artists that they very much recognize. I think it, it's a powerful message to anyone studying in this field that that a museum privileges their work, work as much as a Rauschenberg or a Brancusi or whatever. We have a current student. Um, forgive my uh, potential ignorance. I'm uh, not super educated in these matters, but um, you know, I've been sitting here for the last three days listening to you guys talk, and uh, it's just. I do know that language and semiotics defines the way that we think and the way that, you know, brains develop, etc. And uh, I understand the importance of the inclusion of the concept of craft as art in the, throughout the 20th century. But going forward, why do you guys think it's important that we continue making a distinction between art that wasn't a yes-no question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I'm not the most educated person in this thing either, but, and I, I, my attitude changed over the years. I think there's Knowing more about the history of, of craft and the craft movement, it, it just seemed better and nicer. I didn't want it to go away. There, <laughs> it's very supportive. Um, the idea of being absorbed into fine arts means that we'll get all their problems. And they have terrible problems. <laughs> really horrible, terrible problems. So, by maintaining uh, and preserving a separate identity, I think will survive. I don't think art's going to survive, to be really cynical. No. Art was invented in the Renaissance. It's really recent. <laughs> it's a fad. <laughs> um, I guess the reason I made a distinction between them is uh, it's sort of the opposite reason for the Sort of opposite to the reason that the distinction was usually made, which was keep craft in its place. I make a distinction because I think unless you treat craft as having its own integrity and definition, it's very hard to fight for it. 
opportunity of that local interchange unit. So just as an example, I would want to see those uh, foundry workers, you're talking about Tom, who I think make no claim to be sculptors, most of them probably, I would absolutely want to see them as craftspeople and integrate them in craft history. And I just don't think art, I mean, art tries to be really, really big, um, but I don't think it's big enough to do that. I think, you, you know, there's a lot, lot, lot more craftspeople in the world than there are artists. And so I, I feel like, you know, we have a lot fewer programs and a lot fewer museums, we have a hell of a lot more people to take care of. And I feel like if you give up on craft by folding it into art, you're just um, radically shrinking your territory. I don't see how that helps. I would say, I don't even know why we have to even discuss it. I think craft is a subset of art. It's, I see it in the nomenclature kind of grid. You know, you, you have umbrellas. You know, it falls under decorative arts and decorative art history. And there's like traditional, conventional decorative arts, and then there's contemporary decorative arts. And craft is part of, like design is part of that part and parcel. It's all under that umbrella and then connects up like the DNA chart or your ancestry chart, you know, it's all coming from, you know, a, a place of origin that it has the title art. Craft distinguishes itself because it, and, and maybe this tradition, this definition might be outdated, but it, it, it distinguishes itself because in most, in the past or even currently still, artists choose a material, they aim for skill. Skill is a huge important part of being a craftsperson. Um, and their knowledge of that material are, 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 is inherent in their making and it's something that they, they strive for. But it's within the context of contemporary art. It's not that any of you don't think about what is going on in the world that impacts what your message is in your work. Um, but in, in, in traditional contemporary art circles, sometimes it, their hand is not on it directly. They have an atelier of people. Um, it's about the message and not the material, whereas we privilege both message and material. And I think that that's what distinguishes itself within contemporary art, and within is the key word. Because it's so inseparable, you know, to, to a maker. It's really about identity. It's about how, how one wants to identify themselves. When you bring up the, the notion of genetic code, you know, these, I mean, we live in a state where, uh, Native Americans have to carry a card uh, to show the percentage of blood that they have to be able to sell artwork on the plaza, for instance, or in any other gallery that uh, claims to have Native American material uh, for sale. They have to have a card uh, that says, and they have to prove it. And, and it can be down to the lowest percentage you can imagine. And African Americans also are dealing with the same uh, you know, issues where at what point do you stop calling any of us something different than what we choose to call ourselves. And it's, it really is that uh, simple, it seems, the equation. I, I built our home. I love to cook. I, I feel like there isn't any separation between uh, how I choose to, to use my hands, skills, thoughts, writing a letter. Any of that, I, I think, is, can be considered um, something that one would call whatever you choose to call it, but it is that. And it's that because I choose it to be that. Um, so it, 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 it's kind of a simple one, but I love the fact that the discourse is required in a way inside the world of academia and inside the museological um, you know, realm to try to help people who are coming in the didactics you know, or key element to having people take away something that's more than what they arrived with. Uh, but inside an artist's realm, inside our bodies, I don't think, I don't think that definition is key at all. I do, yeah. You do. So during the studio craft movement, people were afraid of losing the knowledge of how to make craft objects. Do you think that it could happen again in the future? That people could lose skills? Yeah. I, I I don't you know I'm I just I'm actually back at the other the art craft question because I was I was asked when I did my presentation if I would speak about the difference and I said no but I'm thinking about uh, I'm sorry for not answering your question right away but I'm thinking about this thing of there's the skill the craft and everything 
And then there's a transcendent moment where something's just right and you can't even know what's right about it except you know that it is. So painting is a craft and writing is a craft. And then there's what you do with the tools you have within your craft. And if, you, and if things line up at a certain moment, there's a rightness to it. And you say, ah, the little moment at the end of the poem that takes your breath away. And that's what they all could have. So I just wanted to comment on that. I feel like people's sense of what skills are needed have really diminished. And I love to hear people talk about things when they really know how to make things. Or uh, the island where I live on, people who fish, who've been lobstering since they were 10 years, 12 years old, who remember every detail of what the ocean floor is like, or what a current's like. And that, that very specific knowledge, uh, uh, to me, is what makes us most human. And you learn by doing, you learn by being around people who know what they're doing. So I, uh, I don't think it would ever be lost, but it could certainly be diminished. I think it's interesting that, you know, there was a time that skill was lost. It was lost in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Uh, we lost the ability to know how to work with metals and clay and other sorts of things. Studio, the idea of the American studio craft movement hadn't really officially kicked off. Although there are some, there is some precedent in the first quarter of the 20th century, and even during that interwar period where there was was making, um, they hadn't recorded it. We didn't have technology to share it, but there were a few books and a few makers. And when GIs returned back from World War II, we had to sort of reinvent the wheel in this country. People they brought in craftsmen from the UK and Scandinavia to teach metalworking. We had lost that completely, especially giving metals over during the war effort. And in a way, we embraced it all the more. And so I, even though if, if skill does go away and, and this idea of making goes away momentarily, and, and that's just a blip that was a, what, 10, 15 year period, it ramped up in such a beautiful way that no one could have anticipated what was to come in this movement that, that has us sitting here today. Things ebb and flow, and sometimes when we're in the middle of it and we're loving, the, the, we're loving it so much that we're, we're killing it to death at the same time. But it's a natural progression. I guess as a historian, I have that luxury to look, pull back and look at it in that longer view. Um, it does. I guess I, it doesn't scare me that we're having this moment. We had to have this moment. It couldn't have continued. Things have to change, otherwise they die. And then they come back and, and, re, and rebirth in a whole new and more exciting way that we, again, can't anticipate. So I, I really like this um, idea, Elizabeth. I, I, um, I was either taught or just always believed the same thing you believe. Art is the large umbrella under which there are the subsets. I think you actually suggested the opposite, Glenn. The craft is the large umbrella on, in which something small, like what we might call fine art, um, would be a subset. So that's interesting. But it, it somehow it relates in my mind to what you were just saying about having lost metalworking skills in a period in the 20th century. I find that incredibly hard to believe. I heard that same story that we forgot lost wax casting at some point, and yet I'm positive I have whole books full of art deco jewelry from the 20s and 30s with lots of lost wax casting in it. I'm just on an individual level, though. not like not in terms of. I mean, it might think it was decimated, and that you know we had to. Actually, I believe it was probably decimated, just not destroyed. No, not destroyed, just yeah, yeah. but on a lower. <laughs> You know, on a lower output, like very small, and you can like put like during the Great Depression when exactly. everything was was at a little more. I'm just, I, I just think that's an interesting yeah, no, thing. I'm glad you clarified it. I'm not saying it was totally yeah. disappeared. Yeah. I'm saying it went sort of, it slowed down, and it was only small output, and you can like really name who those makers were, and they are the ones who write, like Henry Barnum Hoare's book on. On, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but it had to do with like going to your backyard, digging up the clay body. I mean, how to process it. That book is really important. Those are the books that teach like Carton Ball in the 40s and 50s how to do what he did to write his books. And it was like industrial practice. Exactly, and not, not industrial practice. Coming strict, that's how studio craft differentiates itself from an industrial making, is the idea of choosing a material, working outside of a religious sect or in industry to work on your own, not necessarily a hermit, but moreover, to make output for yourself right. and your voice and what you want to say with that material. So you guys can comment or answer any question you think you've heard in my, in my previous thing, but I'm wondering if singularity has something to do with this. Because what you're talking about in terms of craft being 
um, a big umbrella is actually closer to what you're talking about, Stuart, in terms of craft as an aspect of anything we do. It's the quality in which we do it or the manner in which we do it, right? But what I think about when, I, when, when I'm thinking about this word craft, which sometimes is called capital C, is some amount of singularity. It's not that it's just that I know how to cast some shit. It's that I have a good idea about what to cast. I'm making a one-of-a-kind thing as opposed to I'm really good at making a thing, which I really have very little to do, very little in common with a goldsmith who's doing production work, whereas I have a lot in common, maybe, with a sculptor who's doing one-of-a-kind thing, even if we're using completely different materials, because this is, I mean, I'm going to stop talking. No, but what you're saying is you're making a one-of-a-kind one thing that's in your own individual voice. Uh, it's a Phil Renato because it's a Phil Renato. Oh no, that's yeah. not good. So one way I, I found helpful to think about this is to return to the etymological root of the word craft, which is to say power. Well, not techne, that's oh, the yeah. root. Okay. So that's technology, architect comes from techne, um, which I put up on the board. Um, but the word craft comes from the German, which is just craft with a K for power. And so the thing to hold on to here is that craft can exist either in an autonomous position, which is what you're describing, like a person with a studio that even digs their own clay, very self-sufficient, drawing on their own resources, but it can also exist in that chicken factory that I showed, right? Because if you put me in that chicken factory, I just cut my finger off. So those people are very adept at doing a very, very specific thing, and they're also very disempowered while they're doing it. So it's, I think it's really important to recognize that craft can exist on a very broad spectrum of different social, political, situations, some of which we would be totally for, and some of which we might find quite difficult to accept slash horrifying. And that's, again, one of the real richnesses of the topic and why I think of it as a very big umbrella, because it can accommodate things that we find very beautiful and empowering and positive, but can also accommodate, you know, Irish girls in the 19th century during the famine going blind to try to support their families by making lace. That's part of the history of craft as well. And if you only kind of embrace, you know, the Lenore Tanius and Peter Volkes, and you, that's your idea of craft, you're missing so much of the human experience that is really important to understand through the lens. I just want to say something um, briefly. Uh, at University of the Arts, they undertook this project to become uh, truly interdisciplinary, which would be kind of like going to a tapas restaurant and like picking little plates. And, uh, um, <laughs> This, but I, I, I understand why they did it and what the rationale behind it was, and it wasn't stupid or insulting or anything, but it also really undervalued the idea of focus, and since everyone at UArts has ADD, that was not helpful. Um, so when I lost a skill recently, I have slowly lost the ability to play the guitar, which is kind of actually heartbreaking to me, but I obviously didn't do the work to keep the skill, so there you go. Um, uh, and what I can do in stained glass is I can make a stained glass window with my eyes shut and my hands bound behind my back with no ideas whatsoever, at any day, forever. Because I got to a level that I didn't even know was humanly possible. And we don't really teach to that because it takes a lot of time, and more time than four years. And it's just an, uh, something, I think that for a while we were getting very specialized in the culture and there was sort of a reaction against it that we should become more generalized so that, you know, it's great to know everything about the bottom of one lobster pot, but, you know, maybe it would be helpful if we could tie things together in the whole world. But I don't know, I'm the person who knows everything about the bottom of the lobster pot. It's really awesome. So <laughs> I'm going to advocate for that. Isn't there a lot in your lobster pot, though? I mean, you're not like cutting up chickens. You know, like you, your, your stained glass practice embraces so many different techniques and materials and processes. I am not going to oil paint, ever. You know what I mean? It's always going to be stained glass if I can do it. Um, just a quick question. Who gets to determine what we identify with as makers? Whether we're an artist one morning or the next morning we'll all wake up and be craftspeople. Who gets to make that decision? Um, 
um, with me and, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you do. Uh, we, when your work comes into the collection, we have an, now an artist questionnaire. You fill it out, you tell us a lot of, you know, biographical information. You also tell us about the work and what it's made of and how it was restored or if it ever was restored and all that sort of stuff. But there is, not only is it a, you designate how you want to be labeled, you also can tell us gender and all those other things that we need to be including today. So um, and I think we're being very forward in this questionnaire that we are now circulating when your work comes into our collection. Um, you're alive and we can ask you. If you're not alive, then we have some work to do. <laughs> but I mean, in some cases, some artists like, you know, like Betty Whitman, her early work is very much about function and her latter work is very much about sculpture. And there were some artists who were very, you know, Ken Bryce, you know, and, and he very much dictated his final, you know, the, the exhibition that was at the Met. He wanted to be represented as a sculptor. But, <laughs> But I, if you were alive today, I would argue with him on this very stage to say he started off as a craftsperson. His work, his hand is all over it, and his skill is undeniable, um, even in the latter work. So, you know, one can even, in, with technology and the way fields work in a collections management system, one can designate what they used to be and what they are at the end of their career. And it's a wonderful thing. I, I feel like so much of that question is wrapped up in. Uh, like hierarchy and power of like if Ken Price thinks he's a sculptor, and, well you know the the old joke about the difference between a pot and a vessel is about three thousand dollars, you know. So it's like like that's one level of like what do I call myself to get to be who I am, and the other is I often think about um, uh, you know the Beatles is a terrible name for a rock and roll group really. If you think about it, and you can have people in the garage just thinking what can we call ourselves. And, or you can make music and have a bad name and it's still the best music. So I think the best thing is really to make the work you need to make because you need to make it. And the rest of the stuff is, is so beyond control. You can advocate for certain things, but when it comes right down to the moment that you're going to be a, a maker, then it's best not even to have those distinctions in your head, but just to make things. Uh, it's, it, maybe it's analogous to judging yourself while you're writing, but I think it's better just to be, to, to make what needs to be made because it needs to be made. And then the rest, that, that'll go to museums or people can figure that out later. I think we should call it all dimensional cream all. <laughs> That's from the painted work by Tom Wolf. I didn't think of that. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so I come to craft from the realm of historic house museums, which is a little different. We see it all commingled, functional, interdependent, as opposed to isolated and sculptural. And um, what I've noticed is that a lot of those domestic origins seem to kind of have a place a certain degree of erasure against some of the more radical and um, subversive elements. And so what I'm interested in hearing from you is who are the artists that you've worked with recently or that stand out to you that really still harness that domestic, that functional narrative in a subversive way? And how, why did that stand out to you? <laughs> Somebody else answer and then I'll have to say it. June's surprising me. Um, I mean, if you look at the work of Roberto Lugo, um, you know, he is looking at the history of ceramics. His, his knowledge of of his um, ceramics history is pretty on point. Um, those objects, although the ones that he is generally referencing were made for the aristocracy or those of wealth, um, but they had function and they had play at table. Um, and he is being extremely subversive in the sense that he is appropriating them um, and using. Uh, a vocabulary of uh, a visual vocabulary that is very much um, from his childhood. You know, I haven't been a graffiti artist and a kid of the street. Um, I, I have to say, he's one of the most potent ceramic artists I think um, out there. That he is so authentic. Um, he's the real deal, and and he is using ceramics also as a way to save 
kids on the street, like he was saved. So in a way, he's, he's using these forms, like I said, that were mainly of function and of, of um, you know, found in the dining room and the, the whatever, but he, they're, they're statements, they're political statements, and they're calling out, and they're, you know, he, he said to me when I acquired the pot that I did, was um, the fact that it would be in the galleries and that his children could see that and that it could represent him and his, um, a person of color, uh, meant so, so much to him. You know? So um, I think they have, you know, with historic houses, I know, at least in Philadelphia, there's been a few cur independent curators who have been infiltrating our historic houses to revitalize them. Um, we, ha we own two houses as part of the museum collection. They're actually accessioned <laughs> in the collections management system. It's our Mount Pleasant um, and Cedar Grove. Um, Cedar Grove has all of its fittings intact. We're Mount Pleasant, which is a museum architectural jewel, uh, has nothing. And we, you know, I hope to infiltrate it once we have changed the HVAC systems in there and sort of be more provocative by including contemporary work with this with the historical setting. Um, there's some really great things happening in historical houses using objects that, that are subversive but also speak to function um, as well. Lugo's just one example. What historic house do you work at? Uh, Fairlane, the Henry Ford Museum. The Henry Ford Museum. Uh, it's uh, Fairlane, the home of Henry and Clara Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. Oh, wow, you got all kinds of things you could do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, the way that I would think about this, I've never been a curator in a historic house, but the way that I would think about it if I were one, within the constraints of whatever constituency I was trying to serve and raise money from, which is a real factor that we haven't talked about much, but a very important constraining factor in this country. But what I would always be looking for is a way to surface the unofficial narratives of the house. So I'd be trying to get Henry Ford's workers represented there. I'd be thinking about servants. I'd be thinking about delivery people. Um, I'd be thinking kind of anywhere but the kind of official rhetoric of the house itself. I think that's sort of where we're at in America right now. And um, you know, it's kind of high time to have a more democratic understanding of what a historic house could be. And frankly, I think if historic houses don't in general do that like right away, they will probably um, mostly close because I don't think there's going to be enough of a constituency who um, want to fund them and fight for them, even within maybe 10 or 20 years. And you know, you look at the constituency that they tend to have now, and you're looking at people that aren't going to be with us in 20 years. So. It's like do or die time for the for that sector of the museum establishment. The sets for TV shows, yeah. That's what I was always that. So I'm not in your world at all. I am at best an observer, an enthusiast, a purchaser, a activist. So my question is, as somebody who previously was on the CIA board and who has wrestled with the issues of how much does an education of the nature you get at CIA cost, and, and how is it that we assure parents that ultimately this would be a remunerative choice? I'm curious about your distinction about craft versus art and money. So it's, it's two parts, which is one, does it matter to these students as they go out into the world to represent themselves as an artist versus a craftsperson? And secondly, as we have challenges in the art world for our museums who can no longer even afford the, the kinds of arts that uh, art pieces that they purchase in the past because the world of art prices is so out of control. It, do you see the landscape of money changing with respect to the arts crafts distinction? And and yeah, money often, by the way, has a has an influence on your attention uh, span. So leaving the ADD discussion aside, you know your ability to focus is often one of you know how am I going to earn a living? So I know there's a few things jumbled in there, but your thoughts on on that landscape? One of us has to start the answer, I guess. I, I had the opportunity to be an interim college president a couple of years ago, so became aware of 
well, the cost of an education and also what uh, students are to leave college with or what colleges say the skills they gain are. Uh, and I think it's really challenging. I think you know the best argument you can make is that you are, are educating uh, flexible, innovative thinkers who can then take their place in the world that's changing all the time. Um, I know in colleges, illustration, like it, I'm sure here, is like a, a huge major because there's potential for income when you get out of school. But you know the craft disciplines maybe not so much. But I, I think uh, um, I think for me it still comes down to making the things that you need to make. Uh, and and I feel like uh, the, the the rest is. Uh, um, well, you know, maybe I could quote T.S. Eliot, who said, uh, for us, there is only the trying, the rest is not our business. But if you're trying to run a school, you really can't have that as your motto, I guess. What a great tagline. It's, it's, you know, I, I was a little horrified in the museum today when we were in the Gilded Age room, and there was that one big break front, that's what my mom would call it. You know, and you think, oh my god, why it, it's all about money and power and you think even if i were really good with my hands what i want to say that's what i did with my life you know and that i made something for somebody who was so obscenely rich and you can it's just something that's intuitively not right to me about that so, no, you just said to someone make what you have to make <laughs> <laughs> but with dignity <laughs> You know, I, I guess we've been screwed up for a long time, basically. But there's this, and, and as Cindy Lauper said, you know, money changes everything. And that's what I'm hearing in my head right now. But there's something that's like really askew about that. And you see it in how people make things for collectors who are going to pay money and you want the money to do it. But the original impulse, why you want to make things, is something that's more profound and deeper than that. And how you hold on to that is really uh, uh, unanswerable. I, I, can I just say one thing? Um, I'm probably a terrible person to answer this because I don't really know from like the perspective of a board member or a college director, but I, I think illustration and graphic design are um, seen as very employable, but actually I think craft is very, very employable because the dirty little secret is that we make goods and they sell. Um, oh, I Stop it. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask you to join me in saluting Stu for quoting T.S. Eliot and Cindy Lauper in one answer? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very serious point to make as well uh, in answer to the question, which actually goes back to the, the question we had earlier about uh, local focus in museums as well, which we didn't really speak to. So should Cleveland show Cleveland stuff? And there's also another thing um, to say about the value of going to art school which is that you go to school with other great people and they become your pack. And I think one of the reasons that these conversations about art and craft go on so interminably long is because art and craft are such unhelpfully huge terms that they don't really give you anything to navigate by. It's like being in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without a compass. And what you really want is to know like what your address is and how to get to work in the morning. You know, that's the scale you want to be at. So I, I actually don't necessarily think it's so individualistic is what you're saying, Stu, because I don't think there's, I don't think anybody has enough just inside themselves that they can produce in a meaningful way without some kind of community around them. So for me, the real value of an art school is actually the community that it builds. I think most students probably learn as much from their fellow students as they do from their faculty, instructors, in fact. So to me, it's about creating um, little micro climates of sensibility and that's, that's what I see people taking with them after they graduate, that, that's the most supportive for them practically and emotionally and creatively. We might call out the last word.